So uh, this talk is going to be about a tool that I've been working on called Androsia. And it is a tool for securing in-memory application data, specifically meant for Android applications. So let me give you a brief overview of the tool and what it is supposed to do. Uh, this tool is a static code analyzer which goes through your code and tracks object instantiations. And it, when, once it spots some object instantiations, it tracks the object so that it can figure out what is the last use of that object. And once the, uh, we, the tool figures out the last use of that object, it can instrument code in the application so that its memory content gets cleared. How is that useful? So if, let's just assume that that object contained sensitive information. And you don't want to be, uh, you don't want the code to maintain that sensitive information throughout the lifetime of your application. You would like to uh, clear that memory as soon as it is last used in the code. So this is what our tool is uh, mainly about. Uh, let me go through a quick introduction about myself. I'm Samit Anwar. I work for the product security team at Citrix R&D. I'm a web and mobile application security enthusiast. I've spoken at a bunch of conferences, including IEEE Services, ACM MobileSoft, IEEE Cloudcom, and Cocon. So you can reach me uh, via my email, samit.anwar at gmail.com if you would like. You can tweet at samitanwar1 as well. So moving on to the agenda for the talk, I'll be speaking about the main takeaway from the presentation, uh, what motivated me to do this work, why we are doing what we are doing, and a brief background about the framework that this tool is written on. Uh, I'll quickly show you a demo after the background, and then we'll dive into the approach that we take in order to analyze the code. And that'll be a little bit technical, so be, pre be prepared for it. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and the work in progress, yeah. So. Uh, the main takeaway, uh, let me explain it uh, via the help of this diagram. Let's just assume that one to 10 are the statements in your code. And at number three, you see that a variable x is being defined. And let's just assume that the x is being uh, in initialized with the object initialization. And at statement five, it is being used. So the idea from this diagram is that before statement three, x never existed. So we can say that x was dead between one and three statement. However, x was initialized at statement three, and it is being used as statement five. So we can say that it is life from the time span from the statement three until five. Then x is again redefined or reinitialized at statement seven, and then used at statement eight. So between five and seven, there is no use of uh, the variable x. So we can safely say that the variable x is dead between five and seven. And we can also say that a variable x is live between seven and eight. And it is dead after eight. So that's the definition of liveness of a variable. What we're going to achieve out of this tool is uh, we'll, we're going to determine the last use of objects at a whole program level. This diagram was basically a single flow within a specific method, you can say. So we need to do this at a whole program level. We need to figure out points like statement five and statement eight at a whole program level. And what we're going to use is a summary-based interprocedural data flow analysis. Data flow analysis, if uh, folks around here are not aware, is basically a static flow analysis, but it's not just about pattern matching. It's about propagating data flow facts throughout the program. So every statement contributes some information to your code, and you, what you need is that you need to propagate the data flow one statement at a time whenever the next statement is executing. But again, this is a static code analysis, so we are not executing any statement at all but we're just propagating information that we can gather from one statement to the other and using that information to determine liveness at a whole program level. So devs want to ensure that objects memory gets cleared. This comes after their first priority, which is to make the code work. But 
nevertheless, they want to do that. And uh, the myth is that the garbage, the, the garbage collector will handle it. However, that's not true because uh, the scope of garbage collector is very limited. And as you all know, the garbage collector works on uh, the mark and sweep algorithm. Basically, it starts with the GC routes, which are the garbage collection routes, which are special objects like the main thread in the program or the uh, variables allocated on the main thread or your static variables of your main class. And it goes on doing a defer search and marking all the objects that are reachable through references. And once it marks all the objects that are reachable, it skips to the uh, sweep phase, wherein it will go through all the object, objects in the heap memory and see which all objects are not marked. And the unmarked objects will be reclaimed. So what I'm uh, trying to uh, come to is that developers may forget some references, like the one shown in the oval. And these objects might contain sensitive information, which will eventually be uh, overlooked by the garbage collector and will not be collected. So your sensitive information will remain on the heap memory throughout the lifetime of the application until your, uh, uh, until your uh, Android operating system hits a resource constraint, and then it will invoke the garbage collector to collect these objects. Even then, there is no guarantee that these objects will be overwritten. The space will be available for being overwritten, but there's no guarantee that your sensitive information will be overwritten. So this is precisely the problem we are trying to tackle. We'll be explicitly going to, uh, going to clear the memory content of the objects when it is last used. So in our uh, tool right now, we are focusing on string builder objects, but it is very straightforward to ex uh, extend this tool to any other kind of objects. So unused but reachable string builder objects may contain sensitive information. And a heap dump will reveal that sensitive information. So don't just rely on the garbage collector to clear sensitive content, but destroy by overwriting all critical data. So Java security package has some classes which provide, like the keystore.password protection class, which provides a destroy API. I hope it's clear. So it provides a destroy API. Uh, but again, the onus of calling this uh, API is up to the developer. He might even forget to call this API, or he might call it at a stage very late in your program. So that's what we are trying to do. We are automating this process where we'll figure out this is the last point where your object is used. I'm going to instrument the code. Or we can, there are two modes of our tool, where in one, in one mode, we can instrument the code for you. Or in the second mode, we can just provide feedback to the developers that this is the point where you need to call the destroy API or you need to destroy the object. This is a snapshot uh, uh, from the Eclipse Memory Analyzer tool, which basically uh, tells you the, uh, that there is a static field called static secret, and it has a password uh, string inside it. And this is uh, a snapshot of the heap taken before optimization of the code. And once we instrument the code, at the same uh, point, we take a snapshot again, and you'll see that the, the password is not anymore present. So coming on to the background, uh, to write this tool, we have uh, used a framework called Suit. Suit is a Java bytecode analysis framework. And one of the main features of this tool is that it has an intermediate representation called Jimple. Jimple is a cross between Java high-level language and the bytecode. But it is uh, similar to Java, and it's simpler. So it doesn't have the nested structures that are present in Java. So it's Java plus simple, so it's simple. Um, and it is more or less a three address code, which looks something like this. So what I mean by three address code is that at any particular statement, like if you take the example of the if statement here, uh, there, are, uh, there are not more than three operands in one line of code. One, one is R1, the second one is null, and the third one is label zero. So that's how Jimble looks like. Also, um, 
Jimpl is beneficial because you just have 16 or different kind of statements to deal with as compared to 200 or something opcodes op when it comes to Dalvik bytecode. Moreover, Jimpl preserves the typing information of variables as well, like integer or any sort of objects, which is not present in the opcodes, which is not present in the Dalvik bytecode, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So, suit also allows you to perform intra-procedural or inter-procedural data flow analysis. What that means is uh, you can perform the analysis within a method or you can perform the analysis at a whole program level wherein you, once you uh, analyze one particular method, you pass a summary of that method to other methods so that they can use the information that you've already analyzed. Until uh, like two years before, Suit was missing a Dalvik to Jimpl transformation module. But uh, that work has been completed and the module is called Dexplor, which basically disassembles your Dalvik bytecode to Jimpl. So it just plugs into this Suit workflow where you, have, where you had support for Java, source code, Scala, and uh, now there's Dalvik as well. So you can convert the Dalvik bytecode into Jimpl three address intermediate representation and then you can generate uh, the, you can analyze your code and then generate the uh, dex file or the jimple files again. So another tool uh, that we had plugged into our tool is called Flowdroid. And there's a very specific purpose we use this tool for, which is to generate a dummy main method. Unlike Java applications, Android applications do not have a main method. And Flowdroid generates a dummy main method for you. It basically simulates calls to Android lifecycle methods like on create, on stop, on pause, on start. And it also simulates calls to user driven events. Callbacks meant for user driven events like on, on key pressed, on press, on click. So those kind of events. And let me just show you. Uh, so this is how the dummy main method looks like. It'll basically, this is a call graph for the entire program after we run Flowdroid on it. There'll be a dummy main method which will invoke all the other on, like, methods like onCreateView which already exist in your application or onCreate method. So this is needed because in order to perform your data flow analysis, you need a call graph. And you need a starting point from where you need to start flowing your data uh, from. So this will do exactly that, and it will provide you the call graph with a single entry point. So just to give you a design overview, a developer or a user of an application can share uh, the source code or the APK with us, and we can pack the APK, convert it into, fetch the DEX code from it, convert it into Jimple code, and perform the analysis and instrument the code in Jimple code and then package it back to Dalvik bytecode and create an APK with the resources packaged along with it and send it back to the developer or user. So string builder objects can exist in multiple scopes. What I mean by that is that they can exist as local variables in a method wherein their scope is limited to this particular method only. Like here you see x, y, z are being instantiated, uh, like x, y, z are being reference variables pointing to string builder objects. SB stands for string builder. Um, so you have a secret password that is being assigned to uh, x and y. So, but the use of these variables is limited to the method foo. And they don't have any other use anywhere other than this. So they can exist as local variables in a method, or they can exist as, as static fields of a class. And there's a drastic, between, drastic difference between the scope here, because as soon as you uh, allocate an object uh, to a variable which is a static field of a class, the scope becomes the entire scope of the program. And any other class can access that particular variable using the class name. So here I have a bar method uh, being invoked, which is trying to use x using the class name my class. So there's a uh, difference between the scope of the string builder object. There's another scope where they can exist, which is like an instance field. Uh, here, the variable x is an instance field 
for my instance field SB class. And uh, now the scope of this particular field is limited to the scope of object of the class encapsulating it, which is my instance field SB. So whenever OBJ, which is the object that has been instantiated for my instance field SB class, goes out of scope, you cannot access X anymore. So our tool uh, caters to all these uh, cases. And with that, let me quickly get to a demo here. Uh, I'll introduce the code. Uh, there is a user class which defines the static string builder field, which is called static secret. And then there is the main activity class with the onCreate method, which, which instantiates the string builder object with value password. And in the check static class, we are calling the use static field from the onCreate method. And that use static field basically is using the static secret variable. So there's the use, and then we are calling bar again. So bar, inside bar, we are using the static secret once more. So if the tool had to run on this piece of code and figure out where the last use of static secret is happening, it's very obvious, right? It's right here. There's no further use of the static secret field. So you can instrument the code right after this statement and clear the content of static secrets object. However, uh, that's not uh, how simple life always is. Uh, there can be loops as well. And with static fields, the problem is that if, you, if the bar method is in a loop, you cannot instrument the code after the print line statement of static secret inside bar. Because once you reset, in the next iteration of the loop, you will be accessing the resetted value rather than the original value, which will break the logic of your program. So you need to take care of all these situations. So this is the same code, uh, the main activity class, uh, basically instantiating the pa string builder with password, and then you're calling the use static method, your use static field method of the check static class. So inside use static field, uh, there is a use of the static secret, and then we're calling method bar, which again uses that static secret. And I've, uh, for convenience, I've added a couple of more print line statements so that it becomes obvious where the code is being instrumented. So right now, if you'll see, uh, the code should be instrumented after the print line statement for static secret, which is just below the print line statement for hello, just above the print line statement for hello. So let's just run the tool on this example. So all this method, this is the dummy main method I was talking about. So suit generates, uh, the flow drive generates this dummy main method for you. It's actually in simple, so we don't need to really go through it right now. And the output format for the current configuration for the tool is uh, set to Jimple, so that we need to see where the code is getting instrumented. Alternatively, we can set the output format as the DEX, which will give you an APK file as an output. So inside uh, the bar method, you'll see that there There's a print line statement for hello in line number 38, which is at the bottom of the screen. And the code has been instrumented just before this in line number 36, 34, 32, and 30. So what we are doing essentially is that getting a reference to the static secret, uh, trying to figure out the length of the static secret by calling the length API, and then invoking the delete method from zero to length of that static secret. So we are clearing its memory content. And this is actually the right point where the code should have been instrumented, and that's what has happened. Uh, 
So if I had uh, introduced a loop inside the bar method, like this one, I'm just uncommented an existing loop, uh, the instrumentation point would change, and now it would be right before the by statement, the print line statement for by. Because it's a static field, right? You can't reset it within the loop, otherwise in the next iteration, you're going to use the resetted value. So this time, uh, the instrumentation has happened just before the print line statement for by. So as you can see that uh, in the Jimple code, all the loops are converted to go to and label statements. So yes, here you can see if I not less than 50, go to label two. So your loops loop body will be actually present in label two. And if the loops condition is not true, you will be executing the code from line number 29 to 39. And as you can see, the instrumentation has happened just before the print line statement for by, which is right here. Okay. So similarly, we could have loop, uh, we could have loop around the bar method call, and again the instrumentation would uh, be happening inside the use static field method before it returns. So you get the idea, right? I, I'll probably skip this portion and then give you another demo on this one, yeah, this one. Yep. So now uh, what, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to call use static field inside a loop. And once I do that, the instrumentation point should get updated. It shouldn't happen inside the use static field, but it should just happen right before the set password method call. And as you can see, again, from line number 74 to 78, you have the instrumented code. And that is right before the API call for set password. So what I'm going to do next is introduce another use of the static secret string after the set secret method call, just outputting it. So now, now that the use has been updated, the Resetting should not happen before set password. Instead, it should happen right after the system.out.println statement. So, yeah. Here's my uh, print line statement. And this is at line number 82 is the print line statement. And I'm instrumenting code after that, just before the onCreate method returns. So, the tool is smart enough to decide where the instrumentation should. Uh, exactly happen, and it can inform the developers about it, or it can go ahead and instrument the code like it, what is happening right now. So we've seen what the tool does, but we still don't know how it is happening. And let me just dive into that. So in every line of code, you have a lot of information. And if I had to be pedantic about it, we, in data flow analysis uh, community, we call them data flow facts. So, but we are interested in a specific data, uh, which is the liveness data of variables. And the next few slides are going to cover how we'll formally define live variable analysis, how are we going to compute summary for every method, which will, uh, Tell us, the, tell us information about a method. Basically, it will tell you what 
variables are defined in that method and at what statement inside that method they are last used. So the summary will look something like this. Every method will have its own summary. So summary of foo will tell you that there is a variable x whose last use is happening in this particular blue statement if y dot length is less than x dot length. So it look, the summary would look something like this. And we'll do this for all variables inside the method and all methods in the entire application. How do we generate the summary? We compute something known as def and use set, which is a definition and use set. And we are going to use the definition and use set to compute live variable entry and exit set for every statement. Even the def and use sets are computed for every statement. And we're going to compute LV entry and exit for every statement using def use sets. And once we have the LV entry and exit sets, we are going to use that to infer the summary for every method. Basically, the summary will contain last usage point for all local variables and static field references within the method. And then we'll see how can we use the summaries computed for one method to compute the last usage point of that static field reference in the whole program. So let's just define live variable analysis. Live variable analysis uh, determines for each statement which variables must have a subsequent use before they get redefined. This is exactly what we saw in the diagram which I showed you on the initial page, initial slide. And um, if we had to figure out uh, the live variable, uh, the, okay, so the last usage point of a variable can be equivalently called the last statement where that variable was live. And in this particular code, if you see, the last usage point of variable x is this blue statement, y dot length is less than x dot length. It is not being used beyond this statement. It is being defined here uh, again, but it's not being used. So, yeah. And similarly for y, the last use is happening in, at statement five and statement six. And for z, similarly, we have the last usage here. So the last usage point of a variable is the last statement where the variable was live. The variable is live here because it is being used, but it's not being used ahead in the program, so it's not live anymore. This is an if-else condition, so either this statement will execute or either the sixth statement will execute. So one of them will execute. That's why both of them are the last usage point. <coughs> Now we're going to do the step one, where we're going to compute the def use set for the same code. Uh, def set will contain all the variables that are defined in that statement, and the use set will contain all the variables that are used in that statement. And this is how the def and use sets will look like. So for the last statement, we'll have x as the def in the def set, and z in the use set, and so on. Pretty intuitive. So once we have the def and use set, uh, we are going to compute the live variable sets for every statement. And the way we do it is using a backward flow analysis. So what I mean by that is that the live variable analysis sets will be computed in the reverse order of program execution. So we're going to compute LV exit of the last statement first, which will be phi because uh, there's no variable which will be used after the last statement. So we can safely assume that the live variable exit set for six statement will be five. And then we are going to compute LV entry six, then so on, we'll go up in the pro program, reverse program execution order. And whenever re we reach a branch condition, we're going to take a union over the entry sets of the successors. So we are going to take the union over LV entry three and LV entry four. And pass it on to LV exit two. So that's how the data flow facts flow. If I had to express them as equations, it would be something like this. This is exactly the same thing which I mentioned over the previous examples. If the statement is the last statement of the body, then the LV exit set will be phi. Otherwise, we'll take a union over the successors of LV entry. Uh, if we take a union over the successors, um, uh, we'll take a union over the LV entry sets of the successors. Sorry. 
And then uh, to compute the LV entry set, we are going to take LV exit minus def union use, which we have already computed. So as I said, LV exit of the last statement is always phi. So we have that in the table there, right besides the seven number. And now we are going to compute LV entry. So LV entry will be LV, L, LV exit minus def union use. So that will be phi minus x union z, which will be z. And so on, we can do this for every statement. And what we'll uh, notice here is that in the live variable entry and exit columns of the table, if a variable disappears from the entry to the exit set, that means that was the last use of that variable. So as you can see in statement number five and six, y is disappearing from the entry to exit set. So we can say that five and six are the last usage point of variable y. Whereas for z, the last usage point is seven statement because the variable is just disappearing again. And for x, it will be four which is the if condition. So that's how we uh, basically automate this uh, live variable detection uh, for our purpose. And we store it in a summary. Every variable along with the last usage point of that variable. Every static field reference along with the last usage point of that static field reference. So this, is, this gets even more complicated because you might have different variables pointing to the same object, which are generally known as aliases. So it's not just one static field reference you have to track, it's all the aliases that you need to track. And for that, you need something known as a alias analysis or a points to analysis. So once we've computed the summary, uh, we need to use that summary uh, because there could be uh, a method foo calling bar and bar calling baz. And once we've computed summary for every method individually, we need to use that summary at a whole program level by passing that information to other methods. So here we have summaries for all the methods. You, as you can see, foo is calling bar, bar is calling baz. And the static field references are used at, a, uh, at B5 and C4. So in the summary, you have that information already. So what we're going to do is, again, run uh, our, our tool on this program. And as I said, it goes in the reverse topological order of method execution. So baz will be analyzed first, and then bar, and then foo. And the analysis flows backwards. So the last statement of baz will be analyzed first. And then we'll keep going in the reverse order of program execution. So we'll uh, analyze C6, C5, then C4, and we'll see that SFR is being used here. So we'll put SFR in the entry set for C4, and that information needs to be updated in a whole program level data structure where we want to track the last use of the static field reference. Right now, we have just seen that the static field reference was last used at C4, so we are going to update that red data structure with the method name and the static field reference name and the statement. Once we keep on going, we'll hit a point where we are analyzing B5 and we'll put it in the entry set. Now once we reach B3, we see that Baz was called there. And what we are going to do is pull in the summary for Baz and see whether we want to update the red data structure or not. Since we can see that we are using the static field reference at B5, which is coming later in the sequence after Baz gets called. So we need to update that data structure because SFR is being used last at B5 and not really last in the Baz method. So we need to update that data structure and we'll change it to bar SFR B5 because SFR is last being used at B5 in bar method. And so on, we reach A3, wherein we see that the LV exit set has only phi in it. So we don't really need to update that data structure because SFR was not being used in foo method after bar was called. Yeah. So that completes the analysis. 
so at the end, what we achieve is that we get the last usage point of the static field reference SFR, which is at B5 in the bar method. So just a checklist, we've covered live variable analysis, how the summary looks like, how do we compute the summary using def use set, how do we compute LV entry exit sets for using the def use sets, and finally, how do we use the summaries to compute the last use point of a static field reference at a whole program level. So there are some work items that are ongoing. Uh, one is the instance field approach. I'm like 90% through it. Uh, so the approach differs from the rest of uh, the analysis in terms of the tracking of the objects. We are not tracking string builder objects directly here, but we track the object of classes encapsulating the string builder in, uh, instance fields. So as you can see that we mark all classes which are string builder instance fields, find their object instances, and track the object instances rather than tracking the string builder fields themselves. And as you know that uh, instance fields can have access modifiers specified to them, uh, so we can't just reset them uh, from anywhere. We need to reset them through a method belonging to that class itself. So we add reset methods to the specific class that we are tracking. Like here, we have uh, the instance field X, which is private. So we'll be adding a reset method inside the my instance field SB class, which will be responsible for resetting the uh, variable X. And instead of tracking the string builder X, we'll be tracking OBJ, which is the instance of the class my instance field SB. So we're also in the process of developing a test suite for uh, the tool. Uh, we plan to integrate into the CI-CD model and almost there with the documentation. And the GitHub repo can be found here. Uh, the code is private. As of now, it's going through the legal process because I work for Citrix, so I need to take the prior permission before making it open source. So it's going through that process right now, but I hope it gets through. So yeah, that's, that's the talk. Yeah, thank you. Some reference to go through. Yeah.